Assalamu alaikum everyone. Welcome to episode number 51 with Coach Olaf. I am very excited to have this episode on emotional eating, especially during social isolation and coronavirus epidemic, as, as it will only get challenging upon all of us. Therefore, I'm very blessed and grateful to have our guest for today, Amber Rumenuk. If I pronounced it wrong, I'm very sorry. I'm trying my best. She is an emotional eating, digestive, and hormone expert who helps professional women achieve optimal health through mindful eating, self-care, and overcoming self-sabotage with food. Her podcast, the No Sugar Coding Podcast, has over half a million downloads, over 200 episodes, and is listened to in over 82 countries. She was featured on TV personality Whitney Port's podcast. Amber has also appeared on local TV 50 times in the last three years alone. Amber overcame her own emotional eating after gaining and losing more than 1,000 pounds and spending over $50,000 on binge foods and spending five years balancing her hormones and digestion. Now, she helps others achieve body freedom so they have the confidence and health to create amazing lives and i'm so excited because i can relate and we touch base a lot about this but before we start with the conversation in our episode for today please make sure to if you can we would love for you to screenshot this episode or the video if you're watching on youtube to tag both amber and myself on social media so if you're on instagram for example be fit for akhira and amber on instagram at amber ruminic so a-m-b-e-r-r-o-m-a-n-i-u-k and myself we would love to hear how you're managing your emotions right now so that we can support you on your journey so you do not have to do it alone Without further ado, let's welcome Amber. Welcome to the show, Amber. How are you today? I'm doing I'm doing well. How are you? Fine, thank you. I know this is like whoop I'm on the show. <laughs> right? Like, no, this is great. And it's funny, I caught myself because I'm going, oh, but the stuff is going on. So maybe I shouldn't say I'm doing really well. But to be honest with you, I've had a really good day and I've had lots of really good things happen and, and I am doing well. Um and then I have moments where I'm like, oh my gosh, there's so much stuff going on. And then it's like, okay, breathe and move on. But I'm super grateful to be here with you today because I think um, connecting with other very empowering women and talking and sharing stories and sharing it with, you know, the world is just such an empowering way we can help right now. So thank you again for having me on your show. You're welcome. And thank you for being understanding because we had to reschedule and time zone <laughs> difference. So yeah, it's all we good. Made it. It's all good. <laughs> Yeah. So tell us about your story and like how you got into binge eating and then how you overcame it. It's very interesting. Yeah. Thank you for asking about that. So yeah. I'm going to highlight some key parts of it because otherwise we could spend like an hour sharing because they're just, you know, this, this, you know, issue with body image and emotional eating really evolved for me from like age five to age 25. And it really, you know, consumed a huge part of my adolescence. So you know, when I was five, I was like this little innocent, happy, brown eyed, like brown hair, little mushroom cut, just like so excited for life. And we had just moved out to the country on a little acreage. Um, and so I had to start taking the school bus. And it was my first day on the bus. Like imagine my mom like walks me across the way, tells me to have a good day. And I'm so excited. Like, who am I going to sit with? This is great. I'm going to make new friends. And I get on the bus and the first thing that happens is the older boys in the second half, back half of the bus, they look at me and they go, look at her, she's fat, she's ugly. And then the whole back end of the bus just started like making fun of me and calling me names. And it's like my heart just sunk. And I thought, well, it must be true if complete strangers are telling me this. And so I really took on this identity as that five-year-old little girl and believed them and thought, I must be fat. I must be ugly. Um, I must not be wanted by people other than my parents. They have to love me because they're my parents. Um, and so from that moment on, I really became critical of my body. I really didn't want to have friends who were guys, especially because I was afraid they'd call me names and hurt me. Um, and I was like, dad's good. Dad, Dad's super nice to me. So like we can feel safe around the parents. But it was a very pivotal moment in my life because I really 
I believed it so deeply that I really took on that identity for the, for the next 20 years of my life, which is significant. Um, and I started dieting when I was about 10 years old, 11 years old, or I remember buying a um, 17 magazine and the, you know, girl, there was like a, I think a Roxy swimmer ad. And I was like, I want to look like that. And I guess you must have to look this way to be famous or make money or get love or whatever. I just like, so assumed that that's, you see all these skinny popular girls being popular and getting all the guys attention. And I really want that. And so I remember vividly putting this, ripping out the picture of her and putting it on my treadmill and going, I'm not stopping walking and running until I look like this. And obviously after a few minutes, I gave up because I was I really, 11 years old, but right. I like I have a lot was, to say. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's significant. Yeah, I don't think yeah. people realize what a significant impact magazines, TV, and now social media have on our psyche and our assumption of what we think we need to be to be loved, accepted, praised, successful, make a lot of money, get love, um, and that they make us believe it's all external and it's all about our external body, which obviously it's not, but it almost takes you having to go on some form of your own journey to get to that point. Um, yeah, no, it's so true. And I it's around the same age, like, you know, the teenager years are like the hardest years for yeah. all of us, like both boys and girls. But I can relate a lot because with all respect to my culture, to my whatever, like country I'm from, but that was actually my situation, like, especially when I would go back home to visit, you know, I would mm -hmm. be so jealous of all those girls, like, who get attention from the guys, like, mm -hmm. well, what about me? And I know it sounds very bad. And, like, my cousin was like, that's, you know, guys only care about skin and this and that. Yeah. But I don't know. So I'm going to talk about it, like, open and proud because it's playing in our head. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah. And then, obviously, just like you, binge eating, bulimia. Um, I wanted to get fast, quick diet. Or like right. you know, quick results. That's what I got into the whole eat throw. <laughs> it's so fascinating though, yeah. because from there for me, like I would diet and restrict and lose a few pounds and then gain it. Yeah. But I didn't realize I was any, in any of the cycle. And the other thing that really for me fueled the emotional eating, but again, I wasn't yet aware of it was, you know, growing up my mom before I was born, she got diagnosed with multiple sclerosis and it's a very debilitating, it can become a really debilitating illness. Your myelin sheath in your brain starts to essentially be attacked and, you know, it's very neuro neurological. And so for her, she um, revolved a lot of her life around food and um, there'd always be lots of sweets available, bakers, chocolate bars. I could have whatever I want whenever I wanted. And there was never any like limitations or restrictions put on food. So it taught me that, well, I must be able to eat whenever I want, whenever I want. And it's okay. Like I didn't learn that, you know, we should just have like a little treat, maybe a couple days a week or like, you know, you shouldn't sit down and eat like five cookies and a chocolate bar and have like an ice cream. Um, so I just, innocently took on this behavior of like this is normal it's it's normal to eat a cinnamon bun for breakfast or a donut or really sugary cereal um and it's not to blame like i don't blame her or blame my parents at all it's just when we don't know what we don't know mm -hmm. we innocently pass it on and so for me like the body image and then that food piece really evolved into just this deep obsession to want to have the perfect body but yet i didn't want to give up all the foods that i craved and that i essentially relied so much on. And it was when I was about 20, 21 years old that it kind of, everything hit the fan because I'd gone through a breakup and I was really hurt and really upset. And I was so committed to getting the perfect body. And so I was really restricting my eating. I was over exercising, you know, two hours a day, seven days a week. And it came off really fast, but I still wasn't happy right? I thought, you know, doing that, everything would be perfect. I'd be happy. I'd finally get everything I want. And when that didn't happen and nothing changed and I felt more critical of my body and like my cycle started to disappear and like my health started to decline, I was just like, well, if, if this isn't going to work and like this is too hard to attain and the guy doesn't want me back. So what's the point? Screw it. I give up. I'm going to just go eat all of the things. Yeah that I'm denying myself. And that's when the switch like flipped and I was in full bore binge mode. And, you know, for me, binge eating was significant. And, you know, I'm really curious to hear for you where you were at. But for me, it was like, I would go to the store 
And I would try to justify by going to the organic store and I'd buy literally a whole basket full of food, everything from pints of ice cream to bags of chips, sandwiches, pasta, <laughs> chocolate, a bit, yeah. right? And I would go home and I would eat as much as I could before I was just so full and so sick. And there was that period of time for about six months where I did binge and purge and it really scared me because I thought I don't want to end up with heart issues or serious health issues because I'm doing this, but I don't know how to stop. I don't want to gain weight, even though I was gaining weight. It was like trying to have control, but you're totally out of control. Um, and so I was able to stop the purge part, but the binge eating really continued for probably a couple of years really severely. And I gained a lot of weight. I was now at the heaviest I'd ever been. And that really made me feel embarrassed and ashamed. And I didn't want anyone to see me. I felt alone. Um, I felt you know, that I'd be judged if people are going to see me to where I was so thin. And now here I am, you know, in this space where I just was so uncomfortable in my body. I stopped being social. I stopped going out and dating. I just stayed at home and essentially revolved my whole life around food and TV. And then just going to my like retail job because I just... Me too. <laughs> yeah. See, it's like a mirror thing though, right? Like yeah. what's so fascinating about yeah. this story is like, I have so much compassion for you and what you've been through and what I've been through and that each person has a different story, but it's this collective, like we've all felt this way or like 90% of the female population, yep. that's a significant stat that have felt this way at some point or are feeling like this right now. And you know, what really was my low point was I had just finished a binge I threw everything in the garbage because I just thought, well, I'm not going to go, you know, and dig through the garbage and eat the food. It's in the garbage. Um, and I was laying on the couch, just so upset, crying, worried about what was going to happen to me if I didn't make changes. Um, and then about an hour later, I had, you know, was digesting a little bit and had a little bit of room. And I thought, oh, I could go for another cookie. And then I walked into the kitchen, opened the cover, pulled out my little blue garbage can and I dug through and I ate more cookies and it just devastated me because I thought I I just ate out of a garbage can I'm not this person why am I doing this I have no idea what this is why I'm doing this I hate this I hate myself I hate that I'm in this place I never thought my life would resort to this I'm not meant to be this person but I have no idea how to change it um but I needed to go through that moment because it really inspired me to go, I don't know how I'm going to get there, but I'm going to figure this out and I'm going to take it one step at a time and I'm going to have my ups and downs with it. And did I ever, but I think sometimes we need to have that low point to really inspire or motivate us or move us to want to have change. Because honestly, going the rate that I was, I probably wouldn't be here if I kept binging the way that I was, because I was putting so much stress on my mind and my body. And um, when I started to understand that sugar, you know, refined sugar is 10 times more addictive than cocaine and that like gluten and casein, which are the proteins in wheat and dairy can excite opioid like responses in your brain. And that I was like addicted to these foods. It started to fascinate me to read about how food was impacting my brain chemistry, my blood sugar, how they're making food and designing food so that we become addicted to it and can't stop eating it so that these companies can make a lot of money. Like this all blew me away. I had no idea, but it was fascinating me and was starting to fill the void that I was filling with food and I was still binging, but it was happening less. And then I started to understand how sugar was impacting my my digestive system and how gluten was impacting my my gut health and my you know making me more bloated and and that I had you know gut flora imbalances and and all of this was making that worse and then I craved more sugar but the more I would read about like one aspect of my struggle and learn about it and educate myself and then like be my own guinea pig and start you know I went gluten and dairy free and cut out refined sugar and whilst it took time to do that doing it really helped to significantly lessen the binging for me and for some people maybe they have to cut out certain foods for others they don't but for me my my food addiction was so severe i just had to um but it was when i was still wanting to binge yeah on like really healthy <clears throat> foods like a whole jar of nut butter and bananas like i don't i don't know if you can relate to that but yep. when i was to that point <laughs> i was like this is about so much more than the food and that's when it started to dawn on me that i had this void 
I hated my body. I didn't know how to love myself. I didn't know how to manage stress. And I didn't understand why I was triggered and that I had to not only support my physical state of health, but my emotional health. And that's where, you know, really starting to understand what was triggering me and to not overbook my weekend social schedule, because if I got too overwhelmed, it would trigger me to binge, right? And then um, I started to take more time to get into a self-care routine, especially in the evening, because for me, the evening time was a very vulnerable binge time. Um, so I started to do more meditation, yoga, deep breathing. I got into a really powerful technique called EFT tapping that really helps to ground you and calm your nervous system and clear out old thoughts and emotions. And all of the stuff that I started to step into, it just felt like home. It felt so natural. And I, I loved it. And I noticed wow, my urge to want to binge or my craving went away. I don't need to drive to the store and go and buy the food. Um, and so as I started to step more in this direction of more of a supporting my body emotionally while tending to my gut health and my hormones and realizing a diet is not going to fix this. Trying to be vegan or trying to be paleo, like it's not going to fix my emotional turmoil. I need to deal with my emotions. Um, so allowing myself to feel for the first time fear or sadness was a very scary thing because I literally thought the world was going to end when I did that, but nothing bad happened. And it was like, wow, I can feel and I don't need to shove this down with food. Holy, this is empowering. And so allowing myself to feel and catching negative self-talk when I get critical of my body and complimenting, like all of these aspects of the journey to me accumulatively filled the void. And then it was like one day I looked in the mirror and it was not about weight because it's the irony of it is after my hormone imbalances, I gained about 50 pounds without binge eating. And it's like, I looked at myself in the mirror in that moment. And I'm like, if this is where I need to be right now, because my body doesn't feel safe, I love you a hundred percent. I accept you. And it's like something just clicked in me. It's just like this moment where I just felt this love for myself. And I'm like, wow, I think this really is what it feels like to love myself. And it's like, once I really surrendered to that and, and chose to kick my gym membership to the curb and, and, and kick the um, uh, really self-sabotaging exercise that I was in and chose to rest my body and really honor her, it's like the, the weight, which I like to refer to as protection, it's like it fell off without me having to do anything except sleep and like tend to my emotions. And so when I went through all of that, it was super fascinating because I thought, Everything that I knew about all this stuff that I thought was true is not. The eat less, exercise more model is archaic. You know, the, you know, you have to exercise to lose weight and keep it off. And you have to, you know, keep up a very, you know, regime, strong regime to attain a certain level of health. Like, okay, maybe for some people, but not for me. Like it was, it was making everything worse at the time because I was using it as a form of punishment. So as I was like, just shattering through all these limiting and negative beliefs. I was like, wow, if I struggled with this, how many other women, well, I, and I know men too, but how many women are struggling, whether it's like less than me, same as me, more than me, I want to help people with this. Now I think I actually know why I went through this and why I'm here. And it is to, you know, serve and share and inspire women that they're not alone if they're struggling with this and they don't have to be embarrassed. And so that's what really inspired me to, you know, become a certified holistic nutritional consultant and really specialize in emotional eating, gut health, hormones, ditching diet mentalities, and, you know, building self-love and acceptance. And when I say that, it doesn't mean that you, you know, when it comes to weight that you can't lose weight as well, but it's that we're not obsessing and focusing on weight. It's that we're shifting our focus to learning how to love our bodies, awareness around emotional eating, etc. And that as we focus more on connecting with our mind and body, the bonus is that protection, which is really there because I feel our bodies don't feel safe. It just comes off. It really does. And I see that with my clients. So that's kind of where everything started and where this all came from. And, you know, here we are seven years later being in business. And I, if you would have told me 10 years ago that I'd be, you know, doing this podcast with you and sharing, I'd be like, you're crazy. There's no way I'm going to be in health and wellness. Like I wanted to be on entertainment tonight. I wanted to be like one of those reporter people. Um, and then my life just completely got up leveled and all of this happened. And I'm so grateful for every bit of it. So yeah, yeah. no, I'm smiling. Cause like, literally everything what I've gone through. So I, I 
I believe in myself that I'm a taboo breaker, whatever you want to call it, stereotype breaker, because number one, I'm Arab and I'm wearing the, the headscarf, right? So like there's all these culture barriers that nice. I'm breaking and then like the religion and whatnot. And so like I went through all that route to find like my way back to God and um, spirituality and faith. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, I wrote, I took notes because you said um, the more I struggle, like the more I like you, you listen to yourself and you would like sit down and you're like, why am I doing this? But you, you can't answer that question. You just continue on eating. Mm-hmm. And something that I went through as well, like now I would buy the chocolate, bag of chocolate, <laughs> uh, yeah. the wrap, you know, you unwrap. And I'm like, I'm eating and eating and eating. And I'm like, why am I doing this? Like, why? Like, you know, mm-hmm. God doesn't like this. And even I mentioned my um, interview with Imam Wissam where, like, when I would throw up, like, I'd be like, you know, I, I believe in the afterlife. And that's what um, be fit for akhirah mean. So I'd yeah. like, question myself, like, why? Um, but it's really important. So that the audience that are listening, it's important for you guys to sit down and, like, you know, reflect and, like, ask, like, why, which is going back to the whole purposeful fitness, like, a purpose yeah. behind your why. <laughs> and, yeah. Um, yeah. So like now, how do you manage your emotions compared to the past? That is a great question. Well, I can definitely tell you with confidence that I don't emotionally eat. For people who are wondering, well, can you ever really break free of it? With confidence, 100%. I don't have any days where I fear falling back in or losing control. I really think once you fill the void and you learn how to love yourself and have healthy ways to cope, you can be free of it forever. So for me, it's very important that I have really healthy boundaries with my business. So I don't work weekends. I don't work, you know, late into the evenings. I don't believe in burning the candle at both ends because A, it would exhaust me and I don't want to ever resent my business. So um, having that downtime in the evenings, taking breaks throughout the day is important for me to eat and nourish my body, to hydrate. Um, I also have a very... um, awesome self-care kind of morning routine that I look forward to where I wake up and do some journaling and breathing meditation, kind of just whatever self-care technique resonates. And then from there, you know, nourishment's really important um, to keep blood sugar balanced because that also prevents the cravings. So for me on an emotional level, regular self-care is important because it helps me to be grounded and quiet self-care. So I find that's where the meditation, the gentle stretching and yoga and the deep breathing and the tapping and journaling really come in because they really help to calm the mind and get you out of your head and back into your heart. They help to allow you to be present. And when you're present, you are in your power and you're in more of a space of peace or happiness or joy versus when we get overwhelmed by everything and then we're emotional and it's negative emotions. We actually have something called the ego, which is the self-sabotaging mindset. And I love that you're smiling and nodding because this is huge to discover <laughs> yeah, that want, and okay. be aware yeah. Right. And so when your ego's in control, that's when you're more apt to be a negative self talk, self sabotage with food. You're draining yourself, you're scrolling on social media, and you're working yourself up, and you're just making everything worse. Um, and so, what self care does is it helps you to address your emotions and explore them. And it allows you to take a moment to stop and go, How am I feeling? What do I need? Right. And when you can stop and start to build some awareness around if you are feeling emotional and that some form of self care is going to help you with that, then you've created a new way to cope. And then you figured out that when I feel overwhelmed or I feel sad or whatever it is, doing this actually really helps me to feel more at peace. And then again, you take your power back from your ego and now you're back in power. And that really, 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 really helps to prevent self sabotage. Um, I also think it's really important to just be really mindful with technology and boundaries with that, especially right now, because I know it can be very triggering for some people, but that is how I deal with my emotions is I ask myself how I'm feeling and I ask myself what I need. And then I give myself that, um, because the sooner we can explore it and address it, we can then work through it. And if for some reason, um, you know, you have to feel something for longer than a few minutes to learn something from it or to just, you know, sometimes when the moon cycle changes, like when the full moon comes, I, it's like, I could be having an awesome day, but I'm like, why am I so sad? Like, there's nothing wrong, but it just, sometimes that kind of stuff can toy with my emotions. And so I just kind of go, it's okay if I'm sad. I love and accept myself being sad and I'm not going to try to force it out. So I think the other powerful thing about emotions is for us to not force ourselves that we can't feel sadness or anger or worry or fear. The more we try to force it out, the longer it lingers or the worse it usually gets. 
Yeah, and you know, um, especially like being in business is like really hard with emotions. Like you have to separate the emotions from the business, um, and as I'm sure you can relate. So I hire like a, a, uh, academy and wellness academy with the me and then like life coach. And it took like two coaches to kind of like get it out of me to mm-hmm. understand why, um, like understand my emotions and then like like what you said, social media, right? Like I'm on it a lot. And then she, like, she asked me, like, why do you go on it? And it's like, you know, you don't like, you don't love yourself enough. Mm. And I'm like, wait, I'm always preaching that message to my audience, but am I actually like living it? And it took like, mm. so, and like, you know, especially for people who are, who might be like healing through traumas and whatnot. Yeah. Um, we tend to ignore those emotions and then like go to something else, whether it's eating a food, social yeah. media, what have you. And like, you need to understand, like, you know, your own, past and that's why i'm always like delivering that message like you need to understand like, your past and like accept it and then free yourself yeah. from it and then move on for the future so like it's, it's true yeah. um i think we live in such a society oh where we distract right yeah we distract with things outside of ourselves instead of tuning in to see what we need and i think it's so important that we stop to take time to tune in to see what we need because that's where the self-sabotage ends yeah, so especially like now where we are living with the coronavirus epidemic, mm-hmm. um, so we know like mental health is on the rise. So how can pe- how can we come together and like help each other with our emotions and support so we don't go back to food? And- That's <laughs> a great question. Well, I think the first step is for us to take responsibility and deal with our own emotional stuff, our own self sabotage with food, um, because it's really hard to help other people if you're not helping yourself first. So. I think this is a great time to prioritize yourself, your self-care. If you're at home, if you're not working, or if you are working from home, you can still create and develop a routine that includes like stopping to mindfully eat without distractions of technology, phones, computers, you know, blocking off a certain time of day where you're dedicating it to self-care, whether it's, you know, you're doing your favorite workout or you are, you know, doing a meditation or journaling or reading your favorite book, getting out for a walk, just like whatever makes you feel a little bit more calm and peaceful with what's going on. Um, and then I think, you know, what's so important to do at this point you know, within is to ask yourself a very important question before you go to food, which is, am I physically hungry? Do I need to physically nourish my body or is this emotional hunger? Because like 99% of the time it's actually emotional. And how do you tell the difference? Well, Physical hunger is really, you know, your body may give you some cues. So you get a hunger signal, your appetite all of a sudden level increases and you feel hungry, your stomach growls, you feel a little bit, you know, blood sugar is kind of crashing, you feel a little hangry, tired and irritated. Those can be some common signs. And then you can always check your clock and go, when's the last time I ate? And if it was a couple hours ago or three hours ago, well, yeah, you probably do need physical nourishment. So eat. Um, And then you can come back and ask yourself, am I still emotionally hungry? Do I still want to eat? And if you can already rule out physical hunger and that it's emotional, then it's like, okay, well, what's going on? How, why am I feeling this way? Is it stress? Were you just on social media or you just watched the news about what's going on and now it really pulled you down and so you want to eat because you're feeling really uncomfortable? Are you feeling uncomfortable because now you have more time on your hands and you're used to being so busy and distracted that you never have to feel anything and now you are and it's like, what do I do with all of this, right? Are you dehydrated? Did you have a poor sleep? I think to me, any reason for eating other than physical nourishment is emotional eating. So whether you're happy, you're resistant, you're bored, you're multitasking and eating, you're watching TV and eating, you're sad, you're angry, um, you know, procrastination. I think there's so many emotional eating triggers. So to start to identify maybe what's going on for you and and why you want to do it first before you actually just dive in and eat, it helps you to build awareness. And as you build awareness, you can start to catch it and shift it. Um, And then I think from a level where we can support everyone else is to you know, with what's going on, be sensitive and mindful about, you know, what, how other people may be feeling about it, but don't hesitate to ask how other people are feeling and, you know, give compliments and send messages of positivity and encouragement, um, or provide, if you know other people who may be struggling with this kind of stuff, provide them with, you know, links to podcasts and websites and resources that can maybe help to empower them or help them to build awareness. I think this is such a great time to, you know, 
be in community and support each other, um, no matter what, whether it's like personally or business wise, but that we don't overstep our own, like, you know, nurturing capabilities for other people and end up overwhelmed because we're giving too much to other people and not enough to ourselves because then you end up going to the emotional eating. So it's about finding that balance. Take care of you first. Then if you have capacity, you know, go and give to other people. And if you don't right now, that's also okay because for some people, they may not have the emotional capacity to give too much to other people right now. Yes. And so many great points. So this episode we released before Ramadan is coming up. Mm-hmm. For us, and you mentioned the word hangry, and I'm like, <laughs> write this down. So um, in Ramadan, a lot of people, a lot of Muslims, you kind of like, you know, we get that hanger as well. So it's really important to understand our emotions, especially during like that time of the year. And now mm-hmm. the coronavirus is going to be like on the rise even more. And that is exactly why what you said, find balance. And like, you know, it's so interesting how like in islam like you know even like all people but like in general we're supposed to help each other mm-hmm. and now it's a good wake up call for like family members to come back together yes <laughs> you know oh, what i mean sure. in like the society so mm-hmm. it's like a really nice wake up call from the universe in my opinion yeah. um yeah so perfect yeah yeah so is there anything else i should have asked but i didn't Oh man, I, it really depends. Like people always ask me, you know, like how does this impact your physical state of health or how does this impact maybe, you know, if you believe in the law of attraction and manifestation, how does this impact that or how do people start to make changes? Um, so it's, if there's something there that's resonant for you, I'm happy to share. On sure. So that. tell us like, how do you help your clients? Like what programs do you have? And oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the first step in connecting with someone is I offer a 30 minute complimentary body freedom call and it just really allows me to connect with that person and create a safe space for them where they don't feel judged, they feel open to sharing their struggles and for some it's like the first time they're ever sharing any of this which it's a huge weight off your shoulders to be able to share in a capacity where you know you can. Um, and so you know, you'll know you fill out a little intake form and then we'll connect online and we really talk through, you know, your goals, your health struggles, your concerns, and a very valuable question. What do you think is holding you back? And for a lot of those people that answer that question, they say fear of failure. I don't want to gain more weight. I don't want to, you know, furtherly lose control. It just, it's so draining to continue to fail on diets, etc. And so when I'm talking to them and we, we go to that question, I say, what if failure was inevitable? What if even as we start working together, you're still going to have days where you're triggered to emotionally eat and some days you're going to and some days you're not. But as you go along, if it does happen, you're going to learn a lot from it and that you can learn to embrace failure and that failure can have a lot of learning and growth opportunities available for you. And that if we just sit in fear and we let the fear freeze us and stop us from doing anything, nothing will change. So I often say fear freezes people. Everything you want is on the other side of fear, but to acknowledge it and know that you're going to fail. This is not a journey to perfection. I don't believe in perfection. So the sooner we can, um, you know, have somebody feel like they don't have to be perfect on a diet, that there's no restriction. I don't believe in any of that. I don't coach on any of that. And that it's safe to fail. It really helps them to go, okay, you know what? I think this is something that I, I can do. And it's okay if it feels a bit scary because you're making changes and you're, you know, going to be creating a whole new mindset and habits, but we do it slowly. And I think that's another thing that's really important to share. I don't believe in doing things fast and forceful and harsh because it makes people close up and get scared and then they don't want to do anything. So I really believe in small steps, baby steps, making small changes, you know, creating small intentions and goals. Um, because it really helps you achieve it. And then you build confidence. And every time you achieve something or you um, can actually reach your goal, you're proud of yourself. You're like, wow, I can actually do this. You start to build, like I said, that confidence, trust in yourself. You physically start to feel better. Um, So yeah, so I think that's important to share because the fear can definitely show up. Um, But when I work with people one-on-one, I have a, you know, series of different programs that I do offer because I really believe it takes time to make these changes. And, you know, I always say for every year you've struggled with this, you know, give yourself at least a year, you know, to explore making the changes. So for someone who's been struggling with this for 10 years, 40 years, five years, you know, it's, you have to remember it's taken time to get to this place. And I'm sure you, 
you know, feel the same way about this is takes time to get here. It's going to take time to change your hormones, your digestion, your mindset, your habits with food, establishing a self-care routine, whatever. So, um, you know, for some people, you know, I have a year and then some people will sign up for six months. And then I've actually just introduced to support people right now with what's going on a three month program, because some people really want the support. There's just a bit of a hesitancy around either finances or committing a bit longer, just depending with, you know, what's going on in the uncertainty. So I thought, what can I do to help people and give them a kickstart? And then from there, if they want to do more, they can. Um, and so offering that 90 days to explore anything from emotional eating to hormone imbalances, digestive issues, weight struggles, you know, it's the stress that's going on right now and how to cope in healthy ways and shift your mindset. Like it's just for me, you know, being able to support people because this is a, a time where a lot of people would thrive off of support and really would help, you know, people to get through. So, um, you know, we do a very thorough assessment first to understand their current state of health. So like any symptoms they have going through their health history, talking more about their relationship with food and their body. Um, and that helps me get to the root causes of the physical imbalances and symptoms and then the, the mindset stuff that's going on. And it helps me to kind of create what is a very unique plan for that person and go, hey, this is how I'm going to support you physically and emotionally. And I'm here with you every step of the way. Um, and then we dive into coaching and connect every other week or every week, depending on the level of support that they want. And we talk about whatever they need help with. And, you know, we talk through emotions and mindfulness and self-care and we talk through the emotional eating triggers. I give, you know, natural suggestions for food, season spices, um, the odd supplement, self-care tools, stress coping tools. Like I really, everything that I learn for myself, I teach to my clients and I want to give to them because I want them to have the freedom and the happiness and the confidence that I have created by going through this work. So it's, it's very fulfilling. And I think it's also important to give people a high level of support because emotional eating and these kinds of topics are very sensitive. Um, and so people knowing they can email me or we can have extra calls if need be, it just helps them feel fully supported rather than like just giving someone a big pile of information being like, see you in six months. Um, I just think it's so important that people feel a very close level of support, especially right now. Um, so that's like a long story short of kind of how I work with my clients, but it's, it's just so powerful to see people who've been struggling with these things, whether it's been for six months to like 40 years, actually completely transform and gain the body freedom and, and build the healthy relationship with food. And they always are so excited because they, there's this part of them that doubted they could ever do it. And now they are. And then, you know what they say to me, you know, when we're completing a term or, you know, we're, they're feeling a lot better is they go, I regret not doing this sooner. And I say, you know what? don't regret it. Everything happens for a reason and everything happens at the right time exactly as it's meant to. So celebrate that you decided to do it now and that you didn't not do it at all. Yes. And where can someone sign up with you? Yeah. So if you are interested to further connect and explore a 30 minute body freedom call, you can go to amberproof.ca. I have a link there to book in. I also have an emotional eating quiz on my website. So if you're wondering if you're struggling, that's also a great way to explore it. Um, and if you're also wondering if you're struggling and think maybe a quiz won't be enough, I talk about all of this in much more depth on my podcast, the No Sugar Coating Podcast. So it's a great place to um, hear about all sorts of different things from like physical symptoms, hormones, digestion, emotional eating, body image, everything. So that's kind of where I share all of my heart and soul with the world. Awesome. So for social media wise, what's your username? And I'll have everything yeah. in the show notes and everything. Oh, perfect. Awesome. Yeah. So I primarily reside on Instagram. Um, my handle is my name at Amber Romaniuk, which is R-O-M-A-N-I-U-K. Um, I'm actually going to be starting up a Facebook group because I think it's going to be a great way to connect and, and build a community. So that will be coming soon. So stay tuned to my you know, Instagram and my podcast for that announcement. Um, but yeah, Instagram is a, a great place to connect with people. And I share all sorts of self-care content, recipes, mindfulness, emotional eating content. So I always love sharing there. Yes. So everyone make sure you screenshot this video or the actual podcast episode to uh, tag Amber and myself at Be Fit for Akira. And your name, Amber, I don't pronounce it wrong. Romaniak. Romaniak. It's, it's Ukrainian. Yeah, I was going to say, like, where are you from? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So cool. my, yeah. 
Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I appreciate really, it. You're welcome. And